Um, so hello everyone, my name is Faisal, um, I'm one of the third years. Uh, today I'm going to be talking about um, ophthalmology, so this is a pre-recorded lecture, um, and I'm mainly going to be um, covering the anatomy and physiology of the eye. Um, so this is targeted at uh, first and second years. Um, however, if anyone did want a sort of like refresher um, uh, of their knowledge of anatomy of the eye, this might be useful. Um, so um, you'll be surprised. I mean, the eye is a small organ. However, there is quite a lot to it, and I'm going to be going through everything in, in a good amount of detail. Um, so next. All right, so like I said, uh, I'm going to be covering the anatomy and physiology of the eye. Um, if there are any relevant clinical bits, um, I'll, I'll, I'll mention them. However, I'm not going to be go going over any pathology or diseases or management or anything like that. Um, so I've laid out a sort of lecture plan. Um, so I'm going to start off by uh, talking about the orbit, and move on to the eyelids, conjunctiva, lacrimal system. Then we'll talk about the eyeball itself. So the cornea, the sclera, the lens, the uvea, um, and then the retina. And then I'll go into uh, a, a bit of uh, the visual pathway. Um, and then we'll talk about the extraocular muscles and the optics at the end. So it starts off with orbital anatomy. And so as you know, your eye is suspended within this bony orbit, which is made up of the different bones in your skull. So I think there are about six different bones. Um, the uh, frontal bone, which makes up the majority of the roof of the orbit. Okay. Um, and then you have your zygomatic bone, which makes up the lateral um, walls of the orbit. And then you have your maxilla and your um, lacrimal bones, uh, which makes up the medial wall as well as the um, inferior um, uh, inferior floor um, of the orbit, um, uh, as, uh, along with your ethmoid bone that makes up the medial wall as well. Um, and then you have your sphenoid at the back of the eye, uh, which has the different openings through it, such as the superior, superior um, orbital fissure, inferior orbital fissure in the optic canal. Uh, which allows different nerves and blood vessels to go through um, to supply the eye. And we'll talk about them in detail um, on the next slide. Um, so in general, the bony orbit is quite strong. Um, it allows for any impact to the eye to be dissip dissipated throughout the orbit so that um, it doesn't affect the eye as much. Um, however, um, cl the clinically relevant bit here is that um, it's important to note that the inferior wall and the floor of the orbit are actually the thinnest, uh, therefore the weakest, um, and most prone to fractures. Okay, um, so orbital fat actually fills the bony orbit and surrounds the eye, um, and this allows for like cush cushioning to the eye um, and protection uh, of the eye. Also allows it to be like mobile uh, within the orbit. Um, and then what separates the actual eyeball itself from the fat around it is something called the tenon capsule or the fascia bulbi. Um, and that's just like a thin membrane, uh, which also allows the eye to be uh, to move uh, and be mobile. Um, another thing to note uh, within the orbit is that the orbits are actually um, positioned, uh, they're actually cone-shaped and they're positioned outwards like that, um, whereas the eyeball sits within the orbit looking straight ahead. So you have the axis of the eyeball um, where, uh, uh, and then the axis of the orbit, which is pointed outwards like that in a, in a cone shape. Um, another thing to note is that you have the annulus of Zinn, which is a um, common tendinous ring, uh, which it serves as a site, um, uh, of, as like a or, origin site for all the extraocular muscles, except for one, which we'll talk about later. Um, so that's at the back of the bony orbit as well. Okay. So we'll move on to the orbital apex. Um, so this is where um, all the nerves and blood vessels kind of enter into uh, the orbit to supply the, the eye. Um, and it's made up of three openings in the sphenoid bone, uh, which are the superior orbital fissure, the inferior orbital fissure, um, and then the optic canal. Um, I remember this being mentioned in our HARC or, or taught to us in HARC in either first or second year. Um, and basically, um, it looks a bit complicated here, but when you look at this um, diagram here it kind of simplifies it. Um, you just need to know the different structures that pass through. So the structures that pass through the superior orbital fissure are the ophthalmic division of your uh, trigeminal nerve, which in this um, sort of schematic diagram here, uh, it shows you the different branches of the ophthalmic division. So you have your lacrimal nerve, your frontal nerve, etc, etc. But if you just know that the, the, the CN uh, cranial nerve 5 um, one, which is your ophthalmic division, comes out through the superior orbital fissure, 
Uh, I think that's good enough to know. You also have your uh, abducens nerve, which comes out of the superior orbital fissure as well, along with your trochlear nerve, uh, which is, those are your cranial nerves four and six. Um, other structures to note that come out of the superior orbital fissure is um, probably your superior ophthalmic vein, which is up there, okay? And your an, a, a branch of your inferior ophthalmic vein as well. In your inferior orbital fissure, um, you have other blood vessels as well, such as your infraorbital artery and your infraorbital vein, as well as branches from your inferior ophthalmic vein. Um, and then you have other branches of your um, of cranial nerve five, so the ophthalmic division of your of your uh, fifth cranial nerve um, of the trigeminal, sorry, which is uh, which come out of the inferior uh, orbital fissure as well. And then the optic canal um, is what. Um, the optic nerve passes through along with the ophthalmic artery, which ends up running um, in the middle of the optic nerve. So I hope that makes sense. Um, it's just good to know the different structures that pass through um, and where they pass through. So next we're going to move on to the eyelids. So your eyelids are the thinnest skin um, in your whole body. Um, and they, the main function of the eyelids, it's quite obvious, is to protect the eye from the external environment. So it allows you to close your eye and protect your, uh, the surface of your eye. Um, also keeps, uh, by keeping them closed, you're keeping them um, uh, from drying as well. Uh, and the main thing to note is that it stops the corneal surface from being scratched or uh, protects it from any kind of damage or anything like that. Um, so like I said, it is the thinnest skin in the body. Um, and it contains sweat glands and spacious glands, just like uh, anywhere else. Um, it also has eyelashes, which is a special feature of eyelids. Um, and these also serve for, to provide protection from, you know, external debris or anything like that trying to enter your eye. Um, so that's the external skin there that I'm pointing at. So that's your superior eyelid, that's your lower eyelid there. Um, those are your eyelashes coming out, and then you've got all the different glands um, in, your, uh, in the skin of your eyelids. So behind that, you have the subcutaneous fat, um, and you have different fat pads. So you have your medial fat pad there, your central fat pad um, above as well. And then in the lower lid, you have your medial, your lateral, and your central fat pads. Um, and this is all separated by connective tissue and fascia and stuff like that. Um, deeper to that, you have your tarsal plate. So you have an inferior tarsal plate there and a superior tarsal plate. Um, and within the tarsal plates, you have the meibomian glands, and these produce the oily component to your tears. Um, so I don't know if you know this, but your tears are made up of three different components. Uh, we'll talk about this later as well when we talk about the lacrimal system, but um, just as a brief kind of overview. They're made up of three components. So you have your oily component or your phospholipid layer. Then you have your aqueous component or the watery component, which is produced mainly by the lacrimal gland. And then you have your mucousy components or, or the mucopolysacchar mucopolysaccharides, um, which are produced by goblet cells in your conjunctiva. Um, brilliant. So that moves us on to the conjunctiva. So the conjunctiva you can think of as sort of like a film um, coating the inside of your eyelid. So it starts off from behind the eyelid there, um, and that's known as your um, uh, tarsal conjunctiva, the one that lines the, the inside of your eyelids. Um, so that starts there, kind of goes around, and then it kind of loops around to cover the surface of your eye as well, so the surface of your actual eyeball, um, and that's called the bulbar conjunctiva. So you have it there, and then you have it inferiorly as well. Does that, and then loops around by a little bit there. Okay, and like I said, your conjunctiva has goblet cells, produces the mucus component of your tears. Um, um, next, you also have muscles in your eyelids. So the muscles that allow the eyelids to close and open. Um, so the muscles that are responsible for opening the eye are the levator palpebrae superiorosis, which is this muscle here, and then Muller's muscle, which is there. And your Muller's muscle is actually supplied by the autonomic nervous system, I think it's a parasympathetic nervous system. Um, and it's the reason, um, so in, for example, in Horner syndrome, when you get ptosis, um, it's because the parasympathetic innervation to the Muller's muscle um, is no longer there. So it's damaged or rather because of the lung cancer um, and the APCs of the lung, because um, I think that's where the um, parasympathetic ganglia is, the craniosacral outflow. Um, 
is there. So if that's affected, you don't get innervation to your mother's muscle. So that's weak. So it's no, it can no longer kind of hold the eye up. So you get a droopy eyelid, which is ptosis, uh, which is one of the manifestations in, in Horner syndrome or the clinical features in Horner syndrome. Uh, you also get um, a meiosis, which is um, a constricted pupil, because again, it's, uh, the muscles that we'll talk about later in the, uh, in the iris are supplied by um, the parasympathetic nervous system as well. Um, so another important thing to note um, is the muscles that close the eye. Um, so the muscle that closes the eye and the eyelid is the orbicularis oculi. Um, so this is sort of a round muscle that surrounds the entire um, eye. So it's kind of like a ring around the eye. Um, and here in this cross section, you can see the superior bits and the inferior bits, but uh, really it goes in, a, in kind of a ring around the eye. And that's responsible for closing the eye and that's supplied by your facial nerve. Um, and then uh, another thing that's important is the orbital septum. So this kind of divides the uh, muscle and subcutaneous fat in, in the uh, superficial bit of the eyelid um, from deeper structures in the orbit. Um, and that's important when it comes to conditions like um, periorbital cellulitis because it sort of it slows down or prevents the spread of infection from there um, to inside causing orbital cellulitis which is a lot more dangerous and a lot more serious um, and I think in children it's less prominent this this septum this piece of fascia there um, and that's why in children you treat them much more aggressively uh, quicker because they don't have that layer of protection that prevents the periorbital cellulitis from turning into orbital cellulitis. Okay, so I think that's about it when it comes to eyelid anatomy. Um, again, if you feel like you want me to go through anything further, if you feel like I've missed anything, do let me know. Um, send me an email. Next, we'll talk about the nasolacrimal system. So um, it talks about the production of tears. So tears are produced. They stay in your eye to keep your eye moisturized and, and uh, lubricated and prevent it from uh, any damage and like scratching or dryness or anything like that. So, so damage to the cornea because of dryness or anything like that. Um, and also helps wash away any debris or any particles that do manage to enter your eye. Um, having this sort of drainage system allows it to kind of get drained and, and, and leave the eye basically. Um, so the lacrimal gland is located um, in the lacrimal fossa, which is in the superior lateral orbit there. Um, so it produces um, the aqueous component of tears along with other components, um, and they pass through the excretory ducts, so the lacrimal ducts, and enter the eye. Uh, this is where they stay within the eye um, to exert their function. Um, and then there's a drainage system uh, to allow the tears to drain from inside the eye down um, into the um, uh, so, so it's, uh, through the nasal lacrimal duct into the nasal cavity, sorry. Um, so you have two puncta, uh, superior and inferior uh, puncta, um, which are located in the medial campus. Um, and then they form, go on to, so tears will pass through them into the superior lacrim lacrimal canal and inferior lacrimal canal, um, respectively. And then they go on to converge and empty into the lacrimal sac, which is right about there. Um, and then that will go on to form the nasolacrimal duct, uh, which will end up emptying the tears into the um, nasal cavity, uh, just where the inferior nasal meatus is. Um, and the point where they empty is actually known as the um, valve of Hasner or the pilka lacrimalis. Okay, so the, like I said, the main function is to drain the aqueous tears. Um, so in terms of clinical relevance, Oh, sorry, I forgot to mention. So with eyelids, um, I mentioned Horner syndrome, uh, periorbital cellulitis. You could also get inflammation of the eyelids, which is known as blepharitis. You could get things like collisions and styes, which is where the oil glands or the sebaceous glands in your eyelids get clogged up, and then you end up with a, a sty or a collision. Um, um, it depends which gland, so there's a difference. I'm not going to go into it, but Maybovian glands and um, other sweat glands and stuff in the eye um, present differently. Um, you could also get conjunctivitis and there's loads of different types like bacterial, viral, um, allergic conjunctivitis. Um, and then uh, in terms of the nasolacrimal system, the clinical relevance here is you could really get two different opposite sides uh, kind of other spectrum. So you could get a dry eye 
which is where you're not producing enough um, tears or they're leaving your eye too quickly for whatever reason. So what they would do um, is they would insert a punctum plug. So it's like a little rubber silicone plug, uh, a really, really tiny one that's gonna, that they put in um, into the puncta, either both uh, superior and, in, and inferior or just one of them. Um, and then that will kind of stop the tears from draining and allow the tears to stay in the eye um, and keep the eye uh, moisturized. So that's in cases of dry eye. And then you have the opposite um, point of the spectrum, which is people with really watery eyes. Um, and what they would do in that case, uh, this I've seen this in a clinic where they would um, put a, a tiny needle, like a really, really tiny needle, um, and insert it into the puncta, into the ducts, and wash, wash them out with just saline. So they put a syringe, a needle, put it through, um, and wash these ducts out to remove any blockages or anything that might be obstructing the tears from draining that is causing the watery eye. Well, obviously, watery eyes, you can get loads of different reasons for watery eyes. So it's not necessarily always only due to obstruction, but that's one thing they do when they suspect um, that being the cause. So I hope that was clear. Uh, I'll move on to the next uh, slide. So I'm going to be talking about anatomy of the eyeball itself now. Um, so a, a general thing to get your head around is um, to think of the eye as made up of three layers. So you have your fibrous outer coat, which is this white bit here. It's made up of the sclera and the cornea that continues with each other. And then you have your vascular middle coat, uh, which is also known as the uvea or the uveal tract. And that's made up of the iris, the choroid body, uh, sorry, the ciliary body, and then the choroid, which goes all the way around. Um, and then you'll have your nervous inner coat, which is the sensory, the sensory part of the eye, which is mainly the retina. Um, I think this is a really good diagram, um, which shows you really everything. I like the way it's cut up. And you can see like a cross section, but you can see the other layers as well, like the eyelids and muscle layers and fat and all that. Um, so I think it's quite a useful diagram, but um, just quickly talk through it. Uh, you can see the cornea here, the iris below that, uh, the lens, then you have the retina, um, and then the choroid there, and then the sclera, which envelops it all. Um, the way the eye is divided is actually into an anterior segment and a posterior segment. So your anterior segment is everywhere um, from the cornea uh, to where the, uh, to the surface of the lens, so the anterior surface of the lens. Um, so that's the whole anterior segment. And then the anterior segment itself is actually divided into an anterior chamber and a posterior chamber. So the anterior chamber is basically the cornea um, and it's bordered by the iris here. So it's this bit here that I'm outlining. And then the posterior chamber of the anterior segment um, is the space between the iris and this surface of the lens, okay? Um, and the whole anterior segment uh, contains the aqueous humor, um, and that uh, is produced in the ciliary body, and then it flows uh, throughout the anterior segment. And then you have the posterior segment behind that, which is kind of starts off the surface here from where the posterior to the lens, the, the posterior surface of the lens, all the way to the the whole back of the eye, so this whole surface here. And that's filled with um, vitreous humor or vitreous jelly, um, which you're born with, basically. Okay, um, I think that's it. If I do, come, I, I might need to come back to this diagram later, but move on next. So we're gonna talk about the cornea and the sclera now. So this is part of the fibrous coat of the eye. Um, so the cornea is a transparent, sorry, the transparent clear part um, of the of the eye um, and that mainly allows light to go in and um, so the function of it is uh, it's quite obvious again to allow light to enter the eye and not only does it allow light to enter the eye but also allows for a refraction of the light so cornea is responsible for about two-thirds of the refraction of light that enters the eye um, and that just means it bends it in a certain way so that the light can hit the right spots uh, of the retina that it needs to um, and the remaining one third of, of refraction is, is due to the lens. Um, so the reason that the cornea is clear is actually because of the way that the collagen fibers are arranged. So cornea is made up of collagen. Uh, the way that the fibers are arranged are, is in a lattice arrangement. Um, and so it's a very regular alignment and that allows the, the corneal surface to be clear. Um, I think it's not only, not only is it the lattice arrangement, but also the, the spacing between the fibers as well. Um, which allows it to be clear. Um, so the cornea is actually made up of five layers. 
I'm not going to go into this in too much detail, but just so you know, it's an epithelium, Bowman's uh, membrane, and then you have the stroma, which is the thickest part of the cornea. Then you have Desmet's membrane, and then you have the endothelium, which is the innermost uh, layer. Um, and that contains the pumps that pump fluid out of the cornea in order to keep it clear. Um, and that's the, sorry, that's the sodium potassium bicarbonate pumps. So if, fluid, if the cornea was edematous or had fluid in it, and it would, it would turn into this hazy color. So um, those pumps just have to keep it clear, keep it fluid free, or maintain the fluid balance, sorry. Um, the cornea has, uh, is avascular and it gets most of its nutrients from um, diffusion from the tears on the external surface and then the aqueous humor in, in the internal surface. Um, uh, but it, although it doesn't have any blood vessels, it is highly innervated um, uh, by sensory innervation. So I think the cornea is 200 to 300 times more sensitive than, than skin on your body. Um, so it's quite sensitive. You can feel pain, uh, especially when you have things like corneal abrasions or corneal ulcers are extremely painful. Um, yeah, uh, and the innervation comes from the ophthalmic division of the trigeminal nerve. Um, and then something that you test for, or we don't really test for this in an OSCE, but the, it is mentioned in a lot of like OSCE books and, and stuff. Um, it's the corneal reflex. So that's, if you touch the surface of your eye, if you touch the cornea, then you're automatically gonna blink. Um, and that's just a protective mechanism, protective reflex. Um, another thing to note is the iridocorneal angle, which is the angle between the um, iris and the cornea, which is where I'm pointing to now. Um, and that contains the trabecular meshwork um, and the canal of Schlem, um, which, or am I saying that right, Schlem? I don't know. Anyway, so that, that's, that's where those are located. And that's important when it comes to drainage of the aqueous humor, because that's where they drain from. Um, that, that's where the aqueous humor drains from, sorry. Um, and then enters the venous um, circulation. Um, so if you did have an obstruction there, uh, for whatever reason, that, that you could get increased in, intraocular pressure, um, which, which is, I think that's what's seen in acute um, closed angle glaucoma. So next is the sclera. The sclera is the white bit of the eye. Um, it contains, you know, superficial like blood vessels that you can see. Um, the reason it's, it's white and opaque is because again, of the way that the, um, um, the way that the collagen fibers are arranged, sorry. So they're arranged uh, in a dense, randomly arranged pattern, which allows it to be white. Um, it's pierced by the optic nerve in the back, and then the sclera becomes continuous with the optic nerve, the dural sheath of the optic nerve. Um, the main function of the sclera is obviously to provide structure and stability and protection to the contents within the eye, so the vitreous jelly, and to sort of enclose that. Also provides a site of attachment of the extraocular muscles and to allow the eye to move. Okay. Next, uh, we'll talk about the uvea or the uveal tract. Ooh, sorry. Um, in terms of uh, this, the sclera, sorry, uh, it does, it also has layers to it. So you have an episclera, which you can kind of think of as the epithelium of the sclera if you want to, and then the sclera proper. Um, and then that's important when it comes to uh, things like episcleritis and scleritis and knowing the difference between the two. So episcleritis just affects that. Um, outermost layer of the sclera or the episclera um, and then uh, scleritis is when you have involvement of the um, entire sclera uh, and sclera proper uh, and that's a lot more serious obviously and a lot more painful as well. Um, so next uh, we'll talk about the uvea uh, or the uveal tract. So this consists of the iris, the ciliary body um, and the choroid. Um, and they're all continuous with one another. So the choroid, uh, which is this bit here, okay, uh, that's made up of two layers. So you have an outer pigmented layer, which contains a lot of blue and black pigments. Uh, and the reason for that is that they can absorb the light that's coming into the eye. Um, so to prevent the light from coming into the eye and then just bouncing around the inside of the eye, you have this dense pigmented layer that allows for absorption of the light and preventing it from scattering. Uh, and that allows a clearer image to be produced, okay? Then you have an inner vascular layer, which is obviously high, highly vascul vascularized, and the main function of that is to provide uh, blood uh, supply to the retina um, and like oxygen nutrients to the retina. Um, next, you have the ciliary body, which is this bit here. So this contains a lot of muscles. Um, it also produces the aqueous humor, um, and 
and it has um, the ciliary processes uh, or also known as suspensory ligaments of the lens or the zonules of Zin and they attach to the lens or the capsule of the lens um, and allow it to be um, to accommodate so it can accommodate to light so if you're for near vision and far vision the your ability to focus when you do that um, is actually due to the action of these um, <clears throat> of these uh, ciliary processes on the lens uh, and allowing it to accommodate to light um, so yeah, so uh, as well, uh, so that's one of the functions, as well as producing the aqueous humor, um, which maintains the pressure within the eye as well. Um, then next you have the iris. So the iris is a bit that you can see through the cornea. The, the, so it's a colored bit of the eye. So um, it contains a lot of pigments, a lot of muscles and blood vessels. And of those uh, muscles, the most important ones are uh, the smooth muscles. So you have a dilator and a sphincter papillae. papillae yeah, um, and those uh, constrict or dilate the eye um, uh, accordingly. So the dilator would dilate the eye, the um, constrictor would constrict the eye, or the sphincter, sorry, would constrict the eye. Um, and they're innervated by the autonomic nervous system, they're smooth muscles, so um, it depends whether you have sympathetic or a parasympathetic is, is um, what uh, uh, innervation or input is what would dictate whether you have a dilated or a constricted pupil. Um, so that's the uvea. Um, I think I've covered all the relevant bits. In terms of blood supply, they get their own blood supply. Um, uh, the ciliary body gets some, you could get some nutrients from diffusion from the aqueous humor as well. However, a majority of the nutrients and oxygens is through the choroidal blood supply. Um, yeah, I think that's it. Um, in terms of clinical relevance you could get uh, inflammation of the uveal tract so that's known as uveitis uh, anterior uveitis is when it affects the iris um, and, and the anterior uh, uvea and then a posterior uveitis is mainly the choroid um, that's affected um, i think that's it you could get a lot of like scler uh, iris uh, abnormalities um, and you know, in terms of a dilation and a constriction of the iris, of the pupil, sorry. Yeah. Uh, so moving on. Uh, next is the lens. So the lens is another clear bit um, of the eye. Um, so this provides, again, the remaining one third of the refractive power of the eye. Um, it's transparent, it's avascular, it gets, again, most of the nutrients through diffusion. Um, it's contained within this bag called a capsule. Um, which is important because in like cataract surgery and stuff, um, when you see them um, sort of to extract the eye, they have to first do a capsulotomy or a capsularexis where they cut the bag, um, they cut kind of an opening in the bag, and then they use the phaco emulsification probe to suck up um, the contents of the, of the bag, of the capsule, which is the lens. Um, and then they'd implant the, uh, the intraocular lens, uh, they'd inject it into the capsule so it stays within the, the capsule. Um, in terms of the lens, so it can sh change its shape, like I said, it's attached to these ciliary bodies and the zonules of Zin, um, which allows, allows it to kind of stretch or um, unstretch accordingly to accommodate light into the eye, uh, depending on seeing objects close or far away. Um, so I wouldn't go into, I don't think you need to know all this detail in terms of the um, specific structures but one thing that to note that I think is quite cool is that the lens actually although it being made, made up of multiple different fibers or fibrils um it's a kind of acts as one cohesive cell if you will uh, which I think is, is pretty cool so that's a lens and that's what gets replaced in cataract surgery so people who have clouding of the lens uh, due to old age or trauma or anything like that um, so it's, you could also get congenital cataracts, although they're very rare. Um, they would get their lens replaced, and they'd get a, a, a synthetic or a yeah a synthetic lens and, and implanted into the eye. So next we will talk about the retina. So the retina is the main like sensory organ in the eye. Uh, so the posterior two thirds of it is known as the receptor organ, whereas the anterior one third um, is mainly just made up of pigmented cells. Um, and doesn't have any sensory function to it. Uh, and the border between the two is actually known as the aura serrata. So that's a wavy ring line, which I don't have a picture of here, but I think it's on, yeah, 
it's on this image here. So you can see this wavy line that I'm pointing at that distinguishes between the sensory or receptor organ and the pigmented part of the retina. So um, with the retina itself, um, obviously its main function is to pick up uh, the light and convert the light energy into electrical energy uh, and form electrical impulses and which travel through the optic nerve and go to the um, and eventually make their way to the occipital cortex and allow you to see. Um, so in terms of the blood supply to the retina, uh, I think it's important to, to know uh, where this comes from. So it starts off as the internal carotid artery, which then branches off to form the ophthalmic artery, which will then travel with the optic nerve uh, eventually will travel inside the optic nerve through it um, and pierce the eye. Uh, and then it will go and uh, within the retina, it will branch off. So in the retina, you can kind of think of it as a nasal side and a temporal side. So the nasal side would be here, because remember how we talked about the orbit being a cone shape and pointing outwards. So that's sort of where you can see the implications of that. So, so that's where the optic nerve is. And that's how you can tell whether this is a right eye or a left eye. So in this case, this is the right eye because the optic nerve or the optic disc, sorry, is on the right. So on, in the left eye, you'd see the optic disc here. Okay, um, so, so, so the retinal branches, sorry, are your um, superior temporal branches, which are there, your uh, sorry, superior temporal artery, your super, uh, sorry, sorry, your superior temporal artery, which is here. Then you have your superior nasal artery, which is here. Then you have your inferior temporal artery, which is there. And then your inferior nasal artery, which is there. And then you have uh, veins, which typically follow the exact same path and are named the exact same way. So that's easy to remember. Um, and then within the um, retina itself, you have this region called the macula, which is outlined by, uh, by this um, circle here. Um, now that's where you have most of your photo cone photoreceptor cells, uh, and they're responsible for high um, visual acuity, like high uh, precision vision and color vision, things like that. Um, and then within the macula itself, you have a central depression called the fovea centralis, um, and that has the highest density of cone cells, therefore responsible for the um, you know, highest, the highest acuity vision and color vision. Um, and that's why, you know, when your eye, the reason, for example, your, your pupil will constrict um, is because you want to focus all the light onto this point here, the central point, the macula and the fovea, to give you the best, most distinct vision. Um, whereas in the dark, um, when your pupil uh, dilates, it's because it's trying to allow light to enter, uh, as much light as possible to enter, to hit as much parts of the retina as it can. So that's the central part of the retina. The peripheral part of the retina is where you have most of the rod cells. Uh, and rod cells are responsible for um, lower acuity vision or black and white vision, um, such as vision in the dark and stuff like that. Um, um, you've obviously got your optic disc here. Um, so that's the center of it. Um, and that's it outlined there. And like I said, you can tell which eye you're looking at, which fundus that you're looking at. Um, uh, by the position of the optic disc. Um, and that, that creates a physiological blind spot, which is what you test for in an, in an OSCE. Um, so you do that test with a red pen where you uh, close one eye, hold it in front of you, and then tell me where the tip of the pen disappears. Um, so you're basically just testing how large their blind spot is. It's comparable to yours. Um, so other things to note is that the retina is made up of a bunch of different layers. So you have your photoreceptor cells and then you have your bipolar cells, um, your ganglion cells after that. So there is quite a lot of layers to the retina. I don't think you need to know it in too much detail, um, but just know that it's it kind of um, those different layers allow for the visual, the processing of light and conversion of, of light energy into electrical energy um, and then allows it to travel as an electrical impulse through the nerves, through the optic nerve, through to the back of the eye. Uh, and we'll talk about that next. So the retina, obviously, um, things that could go wrong is uh, you could get bleeding in the retina, you could get retinal tears, retinal detachment, um, things like uh, age-related age -related macular degeneration, um, uh, diabetic retinopathy, hypertensive retinopathy. Uh, I think it's important to know the different findings that you'd find on, on fundoscopy. Um, but uh, when you do do that now, you can like orientate, orientate yourself well and you will kind of know what you're looking at if you know the anatomy. So now we'll go through um, the visual pathway um, really quickly. So this is 
difficult, it's tricky to understand, I think. I, it's, I mean, it's simple, but it's hard to get your head around at first. Um, but once you do, hopefully this will help you. Um, but once you do, I think it's quite simple to grasp. Um, so basically, the reason it's, it's tricky is because everything is the opposite. Everything is the opposite at, at different points as you go along. So I'll try to clear that up. So you'll start off with light entering the eye, hitting this bit of the retina. So your retina can be split up into your nasal retina, which is this bit there, and your temporal retina. And you have that in each eye, obviously. So in this case, that's your temporal retina in your right eye. That's your nasal retina of your left eye. So the nasal retina is what's going to receive your temporal field of vision. Whereas your nasal, uh, whereas your temporal retina is going to receive your nasal uh, field of vision. So that's your first opposite to try to get your head around. Okay, um, and then so so light will pass, be picked up by the retina, and then that will travel in the optic nerve, um, and then it'll reach a point where parts of it will need to cross over. So which parts cross over? Just the nasal retinas of each eye. So the nasal retina of the right uh, of the right eye, nasal retina of the left eye is going to cross over the optic chiasm. Okay, and this will allow your um, so you'll end so so after the optic chiasm you'll reach the optic tract, and in the optic tract, for example, in the left optic tract, you're going to have the fibers from the nasal retina of the right eye and the temporal retina of the left eye, which will give rise to the nasal visual field. So the nas nasal field of vision of the left eye and the temporal uh, uh, um, field of vision of the right eye, which will collectively give rise to your entire left field of vision. Okay. However, uh, sorry, sorry, your entire right field of vision. Okay, because it's um, so because so if you can see where the lines are pointing at, they're pointing at the right. So if you collect these two, put them together, which is what you did here you're gonna to get to the entire right field of vision processed on one side. It's, however, it's on the left side. So that's your second opposite. So your entire right field of vision is gonna be processed on the, um, in, the, in the left side of the brain, um, passing through the left optic tract um, after the, they cross over at the, after the nasal retinal fibers cross over at the optic chiasm, okay? Um, the exact same thing will happen on the right side of the brain. However, you're going to be processing uh, vision from the left eye. Okay, so hopefully that helped. Hopefully that was clear. Um, again, it's difficult to understand, but hopefully this diagram also helps you kind of orient orientate yourself. So you have your first opposite, which is with the retina here, and then, uh, and then you have your second opposite in the optic tracts and kind of where, which field of vision is being processed uh, in, which, uh, in which side. Um, so after the optic tracts, um, they're going to go to the lateral geniculate nucleus, um, which is where you get visual processing. So um, it's the first kind of site where you get input from, from both um, uh, sides, sorry. Um, and then also you get fibers from here that I think go to um, uh, extra pyramidal tracts um, and allow you to like, uh, I think they're responsible for like reflexes and sort of turning your head when you see something coming at you this side and stuff like that. Um, I think it's, it's a textospinal tract. I'm, uh, I'm not entirely sure, sorry. But um, just know that this is where some, some visual processing happens, happens here and you get kind of organization into different layers. So I think the first two layers are where you get processing of the, of the cones. And then the last four layers are where you get uh, processing of the rods. After the uh, lateral geniculate genicul nucleus, um, you get, um, vision, uh, you get, uh, sorry, impulses traveling through the optic radiations. So you have two optic uh, radiations on each side. You have the inferior and superior one. Um, the superior one's quite straightforward. It just goes straight to the um, uh, septal lobe, uh, whereas the inferior one will kind of loop around, and that loop is called Meyer's loop. Um, it, it needs to loop around because your lateral ventricles are in the way, so it kind of needs to make its way around that and then go to the back of the eye. Um, so if you know this well, you'll kind of get the um, patterns of, uh, of vision loss or visual field defects. Um, so if you were to have, starting off with the first one, a central scotoma. So like I said, a scotoma is like a blind spot in the eye. So if you have, um, for example, a vitreous detachment or retinal tear or something like that, any kind of lesion of the retina itself, um, you will end up with a blind spot in that corresponds to that particular um, area of that lesion, okay? Um, so that's 
for example, if that's a scotoma um, or a central scotoma in this case, because that bit is where the lesion is. Um, you do have a physiological one, which is your blind spot. Okay. Next, um, if you get a lesion of the optic nerve, so right there, you will get complete loss of vision in that eye on the ipsilateral side because nothing's crossed over yet. Everything you're, every, every input um, uh, you, this eye is getting is, 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 is in that place, basically. So if you cut it, if you have a lesion, if you sever it for whatever reason, um, it's going to manifest as loss of vision in that eye, okay? Um, so for example, if I were to shut this eye without the lesion, I won't be able to see anything because this, this entire um, eye doesn't work, basically. However, if I shut this eye, um, if I shut this eye that has a lesion in it, I'll probably be able to see, okay, because this eye is still functioning. Um, I might have a defect, I might have double vision, stuff like that, but I'll still be able to see. Um, next is bitemporal hemianopia. So if you break this down, so bitemporal, so both temporal, temporal fields, hemi, half, uh, anopia, no vision. So that means you have, oh, sorry. That means you have no vision in half of your eyes, okay, on the temporal uh, like fields of both your eyes, okay? And that happens if you have a, a lesion of the optic chiasm, such as a pituitary like macroadenoma um, that presses on the optic chiasm. Um, that's going to affect the nasal retinal fibers, which, like we said, give rise to your temporal fields. So you're going to get bitemporal hemianopia, loss of um, your temporal vision in both eyes. Okay. Next, if you get um, a visual field, uh, if you get a lesion of the um, optic tract, which is after the fibers have crossed over. So, uh, so if this is a, this is a um, lesion of the right optic tract, we said the right optic tract gives a rise to the left field of vision. Your entire left field of vision is going to be gone. Okay, so in this case, you can see here the entire left field of vision is gone, and we call this a contralateral because it's although the lesion is on this side, it's affecting the left field of vision, not the right. So although the lesion is on the right, it's manifesting as left field of vision. So contralateral, homonymous. So homonymous basically means it's the same on both sides. Hemianopia, half. So half the visual field is gone. Anopia, loss of vision. So loss of vision in half of the visual field. Um, both on the same, both in the same eye, so both sides are affected in the same eye, uh, contralateral because it's the opposite side to the lesion. Okay. Um, lat uh, la you, those I think are the main ones you should know. You also get things like quadrantinopias, which is where you get a defect in just a quadrant of the eye, and that's due to um, lesions within the optic radiation. So in the inferior optic radiation, um, you're going to get. Um, uh, superior quadrantinopia. It's going to be contralateral again because remember we said visual processing happens in the contralateral uh, side to the side of the visual field basically. Um, so in this case the inferior, the inferior um, radiation is severed um, on the right side meaning you're, you're going to get a left superior quadrantinopia. So quadrants, just a quadrant loss of vision. Okay. Same thing um, when it comes to the um, superior tracts. So same thing, except it's going to be an inferior quadrantinopia. Um, and then if you get um, a, a, a lesion in the optic, uh, sorry, a lesion in the occipital lobe, uh, then you're going to get a complete loss of vision, uh, sometimes, uh, sorry, a hom homonymous hemianopia. So same um, sided uh, loss of vision, Okay, so either of the complete right side or the complete left side, or field of vision, sorry. Um, and you might get something called macular sparing. Uh, and this is due to the way the fibers are arranged in the optic nerve. So um, as a kind of protective mechanism or whatever, um, of evolutionary mechanism, the fibers that supply your macula, which remember we said is the most responsible for most distinct vision, are usually um, uh, protected by other fibers around it. So, uh, and they're processed in a different part of the septal lobe as well. So. Um, as a way you could get, uh, uh, as a result, you could get macular sparing. So you'll get um, no problems with your macula, but then your visual fields uh, otherwise are, are um, you'll have a deficit in them, sorry. So almost done. Uh, extraocular muscles. Uh, so again, I, I think the best way to learn this is to have a sort of have a ball, a football or a tennis ball or whatever in front of you, and sort of play around with it. Use your hand uh, 
uh, imitating kind of one of the muscles and try to see, um, or try to imitate the movements basically, do that on your own in front of you just so you can get your head around it. But I'll try to talk you through it the best I can. Um, so these extraocular muscles, um, they all originate from the common tendinous ring at the back of the orbits, remember, the annulus of Zinn, except for one, um, which is the inferior oblique muscle, which originates from the floor of the orbits um, near the inferior orbital margin. Okay, so that's where it originates and then it inserts into the um, lateral side of the eye there. Okay, um, so innervation of the muscle is quite important. So I remember it as LR6, SO4, R3. LR is lateral rectus, 6 is your sixth cranial nerve, your abducens, so your lateral rectus supplied by your abducens nerve, your superior oblique is supplied by the fourth cranial nerve, which is the, tro uh, the trochlear nerve, and then the rest, R3, are supplied by the third cranial nerve, which is your oculomotor nerve, okay? Um, and just in general, uh, you need to know that the movements that your eye can do are um, elevation, depression, so moving your eye up, moving your eye down, Abduction and adduction, moving towards the midline, away from the midline, um, and intorsion or extorsion, which is basically um, rotate, like a, a rotation of the eye. So a medial rotation, lateral rotation, also known as intorsion, inwards, and extorsion. Okay. The funny thing is, uh, the eye is rarely ever does any of these movements that, like isolated, doesn't do them in an isolated way. So usually does three different movements at once or, you know, so or three, sorry, it never uses a muscle in an isolated way. So you'd usually use more than one muscle at once, therefore giving rise to a different position of your eye, okay? Um, the way I like to, the way, the best way I found to learn it, other than using an actual ball in front of me and trying to move it, moving, moving it around, is to kind of remember clinically in an OSCE, what do we test when we do the double H, okay? Um, so when I'm doing the double H, um, and I ask the patient to follow my finger with his, with his eye and I move it all the way laterally, that way, that's abduction and that's the lateral rectus um, exerting its action. So that's quite simple. And same way when I, when I point it all the way there um, and they follow my eye medially, that's medial uh, rectus um, for causing abduction of the eye, okay? So those are the two muscles that are the most straightforward, okay? Um, so I'm in the center now. I moved laterally, so they've done lateral, uh, they've done um, abduction, which I, that means I know that the lateral rectus works. Now I'm going to move my finger up. So we move the finger up because we're testing um, the superior rectus, which it does. So it's done abduction already, which is a function of the superior rectus. It's doing elevation, and then it's going to externally rotate the eye or um, extort the eye. Okay, so that's the superior rectus that's responsible for that. And then when I point my finger down, I'm intorting the eye. Yes, I'm into, sorry, no, I'm extorting the eye again. Uh, sorry, I said the superior rectus um, uh, extorts the eye, it doesn't, it intorts the eye, okay? Um, and then I'm gonna move it down and I'm gonna test the inferior rectus, okay? So this inferior rectus is responsible for, again, because the eye is outwards, it's responsible for um, extorting the eye, um, uh, adducting the eye and um, depressing the eye, so moving downwards. And then when you move upwards, uh, when you move all the way to the end, you, you've done your medial rectus, you move it upwards, um, that's your inferior oblique because you're externally rotating the eye, so you're extorting the eye, you're elevating it as well, so you're moving it upwards and you're adducting it because it's moving towards the midline, okay? And then when you move it downwards, that's your superior oblique, so that, again, adducts the eye, sorry, abducts the eye, depresses it, um, and intorts it, okay? So when you're doing elevation and depression, when you're simply looking up or looking down, it's never one muscle that's working. Um, it's, it's usually two working together. So when you're, when you're looking, when you're just straight looking up, okay, that's usually um, your inferior oblique and your superior rectus working together because your superior rectus elevates, intorts, and adducts, and your inferior oblique extorts, elevates, and abducts. So the adduction and the abduction cancel out, the extorsion and the intorsion cancel out, and you're left with just elevation, which is what you're doing. When you're looking down, it's the same thing. With, uh, with your inferior rectus and your superior oblique, 
because they both depress, one of them extorts, one of them intorts, so that cancels out. One of them adducts, one of them abducts, so that cancels out, and you're left with just depression, okay? Um, so again, I'm sorry if I've confused you. I feel like I've, uh, I feel like I've confused you a bit. Um, however, this diagram's really good. Try to, again, like I said, try to use a ball in front of you and just move it around and, and kind of see, if you think about it, when the muscle tenses, it shortens and it pulls it towards the direction of that muscle, towards the direction of the origin. So think of it that way, you know, and um, just think about it that way. So when the lateral axis shortens and pulls, it's going to pull it laterally. When the medial does that, it's going to pull it medially. Um, when this, uh, since the inferior oblique is doing kind of that, it's holding the eye from the bottom like that, and it's attached to the bottom as well. So when it does that, it's going to rotate it um, and, 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 um, and abduct it as well, as well as elevate it because it's pulling from downwards. And I was going to do that. Sorry, I'm, I'm sorry. I'm doing a really bad job at imitating the eye. Um, so yeah, the best thing to do, like I said, is just practice using the ball. I'm sorry about that. Um, last thing I'm going to talk about, we're nearing the end of this talk now. Um, so optics, refractive errors. So I've just put up this information um, so you can have a read through it. Um, but basically, the point I'm trying to get across is that the focus of the eyeball is determined by the axial length of the eyeball. So if you think about it, um, and the coronal curvature as well. So if you think about it, the eyeball um, is a sphere. However, if the eyeball were to be squashed a bit and turned into an oval horizontally, that would mean that the length between the cornea and the back of the eye is much longer than when it was a proper circle. So when it's done, doing that, that length there is much longer. So that means light would have to travel a long, longer distance. If your curvature is the same and your lens is the same at the front, the focus of the light is going to stay the same. So it's not going to hit the back of the retina because we said it got longer. So that will mean you'll have a deficit in your vision. So um, that's, I think that's, that's, um, that explains it. So, and then when, you, when it's pushed the other way around, when it's, a, when it's an oval, but it's a vertical oval, so when it's like that, you'll have a shorter length. So the focus of light is back there, not on the retina. So that's when glasses come in to kind of reshift the focus of light on the retina. Um, um, and yeah, so that's basically it. So, uh, again, really text heavy. However, you can have a read through it. Um, so that just explains that's myopia. So that's when the eyeball is too long, if you will, horizontally long. So the distance is, is, is really long. So that's when the shift, the focus of the um, vision is at, uh, in front of the retina rather than on the retina itself, where it's supposed to be, like here. Um, so that's why you get myopia or um, short-sightedness, okay? So you can't see far away. With, hy uh, with hyperopia, or long-sightedness is when it's, uh, the eyeball is too short, so the distance is shorter. That means the focus of the retina is going to be back there. And all of this is influenced, well, not literally your eyeball is shorter, your eyeball is longer. It's all influenced by the corneal curvature um, and the lens as well, okay? Um, you could also get something called astigmatism, which is where your corneal surface has kind of notches in it, or like asymmetrical corneal bowing is what it's called, um, which causes two focus points to be put on the retina, which will give you double vision, stuff like that, okay? And blurry vision as well. Last thing is something called presbyopia, also known as sight of old age. Um, so people get older, you know, once they get, once they hit their 40s and, and beyond that, depending on where they are in the world, obviously different um, populations and stuff have different um, ages, but generally 40 and above uh, is when people start to need reading glasses. Uh, and the reading, a reason for that is because Remember the capsule that holds your lens that we talked about earlier starts to become less elastic. Um, the zonules don't um, move as well, so you can't accommodate as well. Um, um, and because of that, your lens will no longer be able to focus um, when looking up close. Um, and that's why people need reading glasses. Um, and then the last thing is keratoconus, which is um, basically when the corneal curvature is really steep. Uh, and again, that causes refractive errors. Um, and it doesn't allow you to focus the light as properly as you should, um, which will affect your vision, okay? Um, that's just a bit about optics. Um, so that's it, that's the end of my talk. Um, hopefully you guys found it useful. I do apologize if I've confused you more than I um, taught you anything. Um, if you did have any questions at all, feel free to email me. I know this is a pre-recorded lecture, so you guys can ask questions. Um, 
however if you did have any questions you did want me to talk through anything else any other topics or anything you want me to go through in, in more detail or something you didn't understand do let me know if i did make a mistake at any point do let me know as well because uh, i would need to fix my slides um, um and yeah that's it so thank you guys uh, and i'm done